It's about history, policy, and impact. A new perspective on current affairs, bringing experience, insight, civility, and scholarship to the urgent issues of today. It's about our past, present, and future. Your host, Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist, Douglas Blackman. From the University of Virginia's Miller Center, this is American Forum. Welcome back to American Forum. I'm Doug Blackman. As the world has watched events unfold in the Ukraine, Crimea, and Russia in recent weeks, one mystery has loomed largest. Who is Vladimir Putin? What does he really want? Do our leaders understand him? Where will Putin insist these events take Russia and the world? Joining us today to discuss the mind of Vladimir Putin are Clifford Gaddy, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and co-author of a biography titled Mr. Putin, Operative in the Kremlin, and Yuri Urbanovich, a native of the former Soviet state of Georgia and a scholar of Russian studies at the University of Virginia. Thank you both for being here. It's great to have you. Let's go first right into the situation that we've seen unfold over the last few weeks. And let's begin with you, Clifford. Uh, it seems pretty clear that the U.S. and its allies don't have a lot of ability at the moment uh, to convince or coerce Vladimir Putin to reverse Russia's annexation of the Crimea. Given that lack of, of ability and influence that we appear to have, is it time at this stage of the game to simply appease Vladimir Putin and let him have the Crimea and try to extract something in return, perhaps? I think that's more or less what's happened. Um, it's, it's as if the headline should be, it's official, Putin wins game one, Victory counts, but with an asterisk that we don't really recognize because he played dirty. So, but we, we basically are not any longer saying that we expect a kind of retreat from the annexation of Crimea. Conceding that that happened, of course, not conceding that it's legal or according to international law. And now the question everyone is asking, and I think we'll be asking that for some time to come, is, what will his, does he have a next step? If so, what is it? What is the end game? How far does he want to go with this? And this, I think, will continue to be debated for some time to come. And does that suggest that the, the sanctions that have been announced and the more sanctions that are to come are really a, essentially preventative measures against the next thing that, that uh, Putin might attempt to do? Or is there still some serious thought in the administration or elsewhere that this could be reversed somehow? No, I don't. I don't know whether there is anyone who seriously thinks it could be reversed. I doubt it. Not that is the annexation of Crimea. Is it even a deterrent for further steps? Uh, probably not all conceivable further steps. Uh, you know, what he did was very serious. Um, we, there was nothing we could do to stop that. He could have done more, and we could not have stopped it either. He chose not to. We just don't know. Did he? Is he waiting for our answer? Does he have another step already in mind? But the sanctions are clearly, the, the, this initial uh, round of sanctions of more or less blacklisting some 20 individuals or so, the U EU list and the American list are not exactly the same, but very close. Um, I think this is just to, to demonstrate that we don't accept it, uh, that this is, a, this is a penalty. It's like sending the guy to the penalty box, you know? <laughs> it's, it's already happened. You're only penalizing. And, and will that deter in the future? It depends on what the, what the goal is and what, uh, you know, what kind of cost uh, Putin is willing to incur to, to continue. So again, it, it really is about his mind. It's about him. He will make, and ultimately, uh, the decision what happens next. And we don't know that. We need to start trying to figure that out. Rory, let's back up a little bit in, t in the sense of how we got here in the first place and also the, simply the question of have, has, the, has the United States, have our allies, have we understood Vladimir Putin up to the beginning of these events and do we understand the context of this whole situation in terms of how Putin is, is reacting to these things and how the Russian people are reacting to them? Um, so Crimea um, became part of the Russian Federation in, uh, excuse me, became part of the Russian Empire in 1783 as a result of Russia's expansion to the south, as a result of Russo-Turkish wars. Um, and uh, a footnote, by the way, um, American hero, 
John Paul Jones, the founder of American Navy, he at that time uh, fought on the Russian side against the Ottomans as Rear Admiral of the Russian Navy. It was in 17... Um, 87, 88, he had served in Russia as Admiral of the Russian Navy. Um, the Crimean Peninsula uh, from 1783 and until 1954 was part of the Russian Empire and then part of the Soviet Union. In 1954, in celebration of the 300th anniversary of uh, Russian-Ukrainian Union, Soviet leader, communist leader of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, made a decision to transfer the Crimean Peninsula under uh, uh, the jurisdiction of Ukraine. Um, according to his son, as far as I know, uh, this decision was due to purely economic reasons, but there are other explanations why he decided to make this decision. And so how does yeah. that shape the, the current perceptions of Russians today on the events that have occurred over the last few weeks? No, I would say that when Khrushchev made this decision, of course he couldn't imagine in his worst nightmare that Ukraine one day might become an independent state and Russia would lose the Crimean Peninsula, particularly because there is a Russian naval base in Sevastopol. Uh, then, when the Soviet Union collapsed, and uh, three leaders of Slavic republics of the Soviet Union, um, of Russia, uh, Ukraine, and Belarus, met in Belovezhskaya Pusha, and signed a new agreement, which became known as Union of Slavic States. It was on the 8th and 9th of December, 1991. There was, this question was raised by Ukrainian President Kravchuk at that time uh, in his conversation with uh, Yeltsin. And what about, by the way, what about the Crimean Peninsula? Um, and Yeltsin's reaction was, does Zabirai, Green, which means take it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, for Yeltsin at that time, most important was to oust Gorbachev. There was a power struggle at that time. As a result, the Crimean Peninsula became part of Ukraine. So it sounds like what you're saying is that based on history and tradition uh, that it's not particularly remarkable that Russians across the board would see this as a natural event for the Crimea to be returned to Russia. In Russian psyche, I would say, uh, the fact that the Crimean Peninsula was part of Ukraine was act of injustice. What Putin is trying to do with this move into Crimea and perhaps if needed, with other moves, we don't know yet, is to send a message to the West. The message is, the way we have been treated since the fall of the Soviet Union, since the end of the Cold War, is unacceptable. I've been trying to tell you this before. Uh, it got to the point I had to try to tell you that with the invasion of Georgia in 2008. It looks like you didn't get it. It looks like you didn't get the message that we Russians want to be left alone. Stop trying to interfere into our internal situation. Stop, stop trying to fund NGOs that are ultimately aimed at overthrowing the current regime. Stop trying to take advantage, using the leverage you had from when we were so weak in the 1990s, a bankrupt state under basically the, 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 the auspices of the IMF, uh, you expanded NATO, though we, we were promised you would not expand NATO. If we withdrew our forces from East Germany, you would not take advantage of that by incorporating not just, obviously, the eastern part of Germany into NATO, but other countries. That was the deal. And yet you went back on it. You in, and then invites Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO. You then station missiles capable of reaching you know, Moscow, in Poland, in Czech Republic. You've moved right up to our borders. You've defied everything. You've reorganized the world order, as you've explicitly said, but you've done it in your, you've imposed that on, you imposed that on a weak Russia, and you continue to do so, even as Russia regained its strength. What has happened in Ukraine is uh, 
the last straw was reached. This was really the, the agreement on partnership with uh, Ukraine's partnership agreement, association agreement with the European Union that was defined in a way that it was an either or, black or white, you join Europe or you join Russia. There's no middle ground here. You can't have equal relations with both. Uh, and that, again, was not the deal. Uh, and so you've turned the U EU into a political arm of NATO. You are moving Ukraine into the EU. It's simply a, a one more step to move it into, uh, to move it into NATO with, with hostile forces stationed on our borders. We have to send a message. Stop messing with us. The danger now is, is the West reading it that way? No, for the most part, not. Uh, they're not getting the message. Well, what do you do if the message you send doesn't, isn't heard, isn't understood? You have to send another message. So whatever step, if he chooses to take it, it will be even harsher, it will be even more shocking than what he's done so far. Actually, let's take a quick break, and we're going to come back in just a second, and we're going to talk more about uh, the perspective of Vladimir Putin and, and exactly how we got into this mess. Welcome back to our conversation with Brookings Institute fellow Clifford Gaddy uh, and Russia study scholar uh, Yuri Ubanovich. Let's go back to this conversation about the, the, both the, the unpreparedness of the West, of this failure to recognize what was happening in the lead up to, uh, to the annexation of Crimea by Russia, uh, but also this broader cultural context of whether we really understand the associations that Russians have with this part of the world and the motivations that Putin might have. I would like to add something to what right now Clifford uh, uh, explained. Uh, number one, again, I would like to emphasize that uh, uh, when discussion on the unification of Germany was going on, Gorbachev was promised after unification of Germany not to expand NATO. The expression was one inch eastward. And then, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, NATO began to expand. So Gorbachev was uh, under tremendous criticism in the Soviet Union that the, he was um, too naive, that he didn't manage to sign some kind of agreement, some kind of joint declaration. It was an oral uh, promise given to Gorbachev. And then it looked like a broken promise to the Russians. Now, they swallowed the fact that a number of um, Eastern European countries were incorporated into NATO. But I would say that um, Ukraine is a special case for Russia. Because let me remind you that Kiev is, um, in Russian psyche, um, extremely important place. This is where East Slavs, predecessors of Russians and Ukrainians, in 988 converted to Christianity. So in their perception, Kiev is their common Jerusalem. And for them to see their common Jerusalem in a military union in which Russia is not participating as a full member is something like for London to see Scotland in a military union with China, for example. <laughs> um, so it is extremely painful for the Russians. All of this so far has been about why it is that Russians see this situation so differently than the way that Americans do. And I think that very few of us have an understanding of the cultural context that you're talking about. But when the US claims that this annexation violates international norms, that it is effectively an illegal act, what's our basis for that claim? Well, I'm not a legal expert, but there are a number of, number of treaties, a number of formal written agreements that, that are typically cited in this, uh, in this respect. Uh, and let me just identify one of them. Uh, in 1994, as you recall, Ukraine, as Russia, inherited the Soviet nuclear arsenal, the nuclear weapons. Uh, we, the West, the United States, persuaded the Ukrainians to actually abandon those nuclear weapons, convinced them that this was not a good idea that they had them. Uh, it required a great deal of effort to protect them. It was not worth it. Uh, that they were not under threat anyway, because obviously Russia was not a threat and the West was friends of theirs. So, you know, why not? Uh, we would take care of them and destroy them. 
And that was a, considered to be a major accomplishment for denuclearization, one of the great success, success stories of arms control. But in order to have formalized that promise that you don't have anything to fear having given up your nuclear weapons, Britain, Britain, Russia, the United States, I don't know, maybe Fran France, I guess, as a nuclear power, signed the Budapest Agreement to that effect, respecting the territorial sovereignty and independence of Ukraine. Often things that are written on paper depended on the power relationships at the time. Vladimir Putin, I am quite convinced, doesn't consider any paper that was signed by the Russian leadership of the 1990s as really valid. Yes, maybe Yeltsin signed that paper. Did he have a choice? Of course not. Russia had $16 billion debt to the IMF. It was in receivership. It had no choice. It couldn't have imported the food it needed to, to simply survive. So it was under duress. It's, you know, legally you would say, yeah, I signed that contract, you know, s signing over my house to that guy, but I, I, I had to. I was tricked. I was, it was under duress. That's sort of the mentality. And in effect, what Putin has been saying all along, though not all, always or even directly ever in, in words, is that all of that, all of those changes, I don't care if they were in, institutionalized in, in formal agreements that occurred when Russia was too weak to actually assert its own rights. They're really not valid. And we want to start over. And what about the, the argument, the Bill of Particulars, really, that, that, that Putin presents against the United States and against the West, but particularly against the United States, in terms of our own conduct? Uh, speaking about Russians like to make parallel, including Putin, with Kosovo. Of course, in Kosovo, from my point of view, I'm also not a specialist in uh, international law, I would say that there was a violation of Serbian law, of domestic law. Uh, when independence of Kosovo was recognized. But uh, the official um, analysis of this case by international, uh, the United Nations International Court, uh, you know, their conclusion was that international law at least doesn't prohibit self-determination. Uh, the United States has generally uh, 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 adhered to the idea that self-determination is a good thing. I mean, we've done all the way back to Woodrow Wilson, the end of World War I, this notion that people should, in fact, be able to decide what their government is and who their leaders are. That, in fact, is essentially the argument that says why the, the ouster of uh, Yanukovych as the leader of the Ukraine was not a coup, but, in fact, was a legitimate expression of the Ukrainian people. And so how is it, then, that we find the logic that this expression by the, the ethnically Russian people of the Crimean Peninsula is not an equally legitimate kind of self-determination. Um, it's very easy to get bogged down in these legalities. Putin loves to play the double standards game against us. We've invited basically everybody to attack us on this because we do have double standards. And probably it's good that somebody criticizes it for us, although when Putin does it or the Chinese does it, we, we don't listen. But that's 90% that of the discussion, 95% of the discussion about Ukra the, the Putin's move into Ukraine, it seems to get bogged down in these, you said, I said, tit for tat, you did this, and we can do that, the legalities. This is not the issue, and it really confuses and confounds the essence of this, which is, I don't, I mean, he could find any motivation. As I said, he, he's playing very much the Russian uh, great identity history card. He's an expert on Russian history, uh, fancies himself a Russian exper uh, expert on Russian history. He loves to play those cards. Uh, he loves to play the legalistic game. Of course, he has training as a lawyer. That was his formal university thing. And he loves to have, get in debates. Um, I actually once heard, and maybe Bush has writ written about the George Bush, the younger, has written about this to other people, but I happen to have had one time a meeting with him when he wanted to talk about Vladimir Putin, and it was very revealing, but I'm, I'll never forget one thing Bush said. He said, yeah, talking to, talking to Vladimir Putin, that's like debating with an eighth grader. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's exactly right. You can go on with that sort of thing. And for Putin, it's more like a game that he plays. But it's not really the essence of this story, which is what I was indicating earlier. It's this idea the West is out to get Russia. If, if, if Russia would be left alone, History, destiny, God, I don't know, or all three, would make Russia into its 
fulfill its destiny as a great nation, a this great is, power. This is Vladimir Putin's this perspective. This is Putin and this is Russian. The rest of the world, for whatever reason, doesn't want Russia to fulfill that destiny. We are now strong enough, and what's happened over the past year and a half is become militarily well organized enough to at least take stump, some steps to send the message, you can't keep doing that. Just so we're clear, both of you would agree, I think, that, that this isn't something that Russia should have done or that Putin should have done. I mean, that, that there, there is a problem with their having, having done the annexation of the Crimea. It's a bad thing. It's not a good thing. Um, yeah, so we're not, you're not defending Putin. We're trying to explain trying to understand yeah, how why, he, why he did yeah. the, these things. Yeah, we are not defending, but I would say that circumstances that were established in Ukraine and around Ukraine, it is not just Putin's fault. I mean, yeah, many actors participated, I would say, in establishing this situation. But so how is it in specific ways that we have affronted Putin or affronted the Russian people uh, that, that maybe makes more sense of their reaction to this? Many in Russia made conclusion that there is a uh, uh, concrete goal uh, in the West to wrest away Ukraine from Russia. The problem with Ukraine is, with my full respect to my brothers Ukrainians, that um, uh, Ukraine in its contemporary borders was established when uh, Soviet Union and Germany divided territories between the Soviet Union and Germany into spheres of influence. Um, Stalin annexed eastern Poland where western Ukraine is located, mainly, I mean, Halicia, and incorporated it into Soviet Socialist Republic of Ukraine. Uh, frankly speaking, these were pretty incompatible parts um, of, of, of Ukraine uh, because traditionally, uh, Eastern Ukraine, they were very pro-Russian. Most people spoke Russian. Religiously, they are Orthodox Christians. In the West, there was always strong sense of national identity, of nationalism. They spoke Ukrainian language, and you know, many of them were either Unions or they were Catholics. Of course, in 1939, Soviets began policy of Sovietization in Western Ukraine, which was hated by Ukrainians. As a result, when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, many of them collaborated with Germans. Let me ask you specifically something about that, uh, because that's, uh, that's an important part of the dialogue. When, after the annexation began, after these mystery troops first appeared in the Crimean Peninsula, and during the time that Putin was very openly saying, no, 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 we don't, I don't know who those people are, we don't have anything to do with this, uh, he gave a re fairly remarkable press conference uh, in Moscow just after the Olympics, uh, in which I believe for the first time he said, he began using the words very explicitly that, that what was happening in Kiev and what was happening in Ukraine was the work of fascists, anti-Semites, uh, all but referred to the uh, the protesters who had just run Yanukovych out of the country uh, as Nazis. To American ears, that was the most absurd, the most uh, sort of baffling thing that had come out of Putin's mouth. What on earth could he be talking about? But in fact, there's a history there where those, those are words that really mean something to the Russian people, right? Absolutely. You know, during the war, um, uh, in Western Ukraine, there were established, uh, you know, units um, which definitely collaborated with uh, with Germans. There were Ukrainian Nazis. units Ukrainian that, units. that fought yes. against the Soviet Union. And they Union. actively participated in, uh, you know, war against the Soviet army. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there were many tragic events when, you know, they exterminated significant number of Poles. They participated in the Holocaust. Um, and, you know, some people who today participate in the so-called Ukrainian Revolution are descendants of those uh, organizations and units um, who actively collaborated with the enemy during World War II. And naturally, and they try, you know, to glorify such, uh, um, uh, you know, leaders of nationalistic movement like Shukhevich, like uh, uh, Bandera, 
Um, and as a result, these two parts of Ukraine see their history in a different way. They have different heroes. They have different identity. And, you know, to marry them is extremely difficult. Okay, let's take another very short break. Uh, and when we come back in just a second, uh, we'll, we'll talk much more specifically about the mind of Vladimir Putin. Welcome back to our conversation with Brookings Institute fellow Clifford Gaddy uh, and Russia study scholar uh, Yuri Ubanovich. Uh, Clifford, you've met Vladimir Putin uh, a half dozen times or something like that over the course of work that you've done over the past decade. Uh, you've written a biography of him, one of only really a handful, uh, written by Westerners at least. Uh, you talk about in your book the many faces uh, or the many versions of Vladimir Putin. But tell us, based on that experience and the research you've done, who is the guy? What, what are the primary faces of Vladimir Putin? Well, how does he think? Where do his ideas come from? We have to always keep in mind that he is, by training, by his main set of skills, he's a KGB officer. He's a secret policeman. He's a secret operative. Uh, that means it's very difficult to take at face value anything he says. How do you get around that? How do you get below what the veneer is? And even on the cover of the book, we sort of play with this idea about the false, fake identities that Putin has, the, the archaeologist, the ecologist, the, the hockey player, the, you know, all these different identities, the ho bare, bare chested horseback rider in Siberia and so forth. Though you uh, say he actually is buff, right? <laughs> I don't, I've never seen him bare-chested, but I, I actually saw him a few weeks after those first uh, photo shots with him bare-chested on the horse in Siberia, and believe me, he couldn't even button his top button on the collar. He was so bulked up. Because um, I thought, you know, a lot of people discuss whether it's photoshopped. And, well, no, it, it was not photoshopped. Uh, but, but, but back to Putin and these identities. So try to understand if a guy is, is dissembling all the time, can we ever figure out what he really thinks? What, is there something deep down there? Um, who is he? This led us to think about Russian history in general, Russian culture. It led us to think about a number of things, about where he grew up in the city of Leningrad, where he was posted abroad as a KGB agent in the city of Dresden in East Germany, and how and when he came to Moscow in 1996. Well, we decided he's not a simple person despite the, the, the set of vulgar interpretations of Putin that it's all very simple. He's just out for the money. He's just out for the power. He's a thug. I mean, there's always a one-word description. He's usually a you know, former KGB operative. That somehow explains it all, or former KGB officer, as if you, know, you get this mental image of him down in the, in the basement of the KGB headquarters torturing people or something. But it's much more sophisticated than that. Maybe not necessarily nicer, but it's more sophisticated. Uh, and we decided that you could obviously have an infinite range almost of, of different aspects of a person's personality, anyone's, but we've honed it down to six aspects of this man, six identities that we then, as I said, traced the historical roots of each and then how that translated into the way of thinking. And th those were very briefly, we talked about him, Putin the statist, the Russian word gosudarstvenik, the guy who uh, believes in the supremacy of the state really over the individual but also the historical uh, notion of the Russian state through history that Yuri has referred to. Uh, the second is, we call it the man of history. It's an ambiguous sense of a man who studies history and fancies himself a real expert on, on especially Russian history, but also maybe a figure in history, but history is very important. Putin is a man without a vision for the future. He never presents a vision for Russia's future. He talks about Russia's past and somehow, as I said, the future will take care of itself. If everybody would just leave us alone, we'd become a great nation, as we're destined to do. But I'm not going to tell you exactly how that would look. So the man of history. The third is the survivalist. And even there, there's an ambiguity. Sometimes we call him the survivor, sometimes the survivalist. Russia is a nation of survivors and survivalists. Learning from the lessons of history that you can never be sure that our future is secure. And we may have to rely on all possible means just to survive. And we can do it. We've proved in history we can do it like nobody else in the world. Uh, so Putin has internalized a lot of that. 
You know, he lost two brothers, two older brothers, in the siege of Leningrad. The, the Nazis surrounded Leningrad, 800,000, maybe even more Len uh, Leningraders died. Two of those were his older brothers. So his family survived the siege of Leningrad. Um, very personal relationship there. Those three identities, statist, man of history, and the survivalist, for us, for Fiona Hill and myself, define his overall goals for Russia. They're sort of embedded in those, in those ideas. The la there are three more identities. The identity of the outsider, the identity of the free marketeer, sometimes we put that in quotes, but we explain it, and finally, the operative. Those three are better at explaining the methods by which he, the, the methods he employs to achieve those goals. So it's means and ends, or ends and means. Um, the outsider uh, is very important for understanding Putin. And he comes from Leningrad. You're automatically a, an outsider if you come from now St. Petersburg, because why? Because Moscow is the insiders. It's the city. You're always, and you have a grudge, right? Putin also was from modest, at least socioeconomic circumstances. His parents were of working class, and he lived in a kind of rundown <coughs> part uh, and a tough neighborhood in, in Leningrad. Uh, he actually was an outsider when he was brought into the KGB. He was brought into the KGB by the new leader of the KGB at the time, Yuri Andropov, who later became the general secretary of the Communist Party, in a, in a, a concerted program to infiltrate, if you like, the KGB with a new cohort of the best and the brightest of the younger generation to modernize the KB KGB, get them to think that you don't, just, you don't only beat up people in the basement of the, of the Lubyanka prison. You can also use some more sophisticated techniques of sociological studies, polling, figure out, you know, preempt opposition movements rather than just crush them. Uh, it's a long tradition in Russian secret services that was revived by Andropov. Vladimir Putin was brought in. But that meant he was an insider to the an outsider, excuse me, to the insiders of the established KGB ranks. And then there, you know, time after time, you see him playing this role, sent to Dresden during the, what, the second half of the 1980s, the period of Mikhail Gorbachev, Perestroika. He was not part of that at all. He has no personal connection whatsoever to all the exciting, tumultuous uh, events that are going on that his people his age and, and, and so on would have shared and could reflect on. So he's outside of there. He's brought from St. Petersburg into Moscow by the team of reformers under Yeltsin. He's an outsider. And of course, he ends up being a, sort of a Frankenstein monster for them. They thought he was one of them and, you know, the pro-reform guy. Of course, he's no longer the outsider, and that's one of his weaknesses now. Well, he sounds like a great character in a Russian novel, is what he sounds like, <laughs> yeah. uh, which perhaps that's what we're dealing with. But, but, but Yuri, the, this, this version of, of Putin, is this the way that he's perceived in Russia as this, uh, this, this man of many faces, none of which perhaps is real, or is the Putin story largely accepted on its face? And, you know, I would say to understand how he's perceived, uh, we need to remember the context when he came to power. Because don't forget that in 1990s, situation in Russia was awful. Uh, decline of population was more than one million every year. Uh, you know, privatization campaign in, 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 in Russia, in my view, was the biggest robbery in mankind's history, which divided the society into a very wealthy minority and very poor majority. Criminalization of society was inconceivable. Uh, life expectancy for men dropped down to 56 years. It is, you know, difficult to imagine. And there was ethnic conflict in the Caucasus. Uh, you know, North Caucasians, specifically Chechens, declared a jihad against Russia. The situation, everything was falling apart. Russia was falling apart. And here is a guy who comes after Yeltsin, who was pretty sick, especially last years, you know, when people saw him from time to time being drunk, you know, which is not very good for a leader of a great power, you know. And here is Putin. Physically strong, very healthy, workaholic, who always emphasized that he had two natures, Russian and German. And uh, in addition to what uh, Clifford just mentioned, I would like to emphasize that uh, he was intelligence officer. So in the KGB, 
intelligence officers were a kind of aristocracy, you know, because they learned foreign languages, they lived for a long period of time abroad, especially in the West, and they had much better understanding what's going on in the world, much more objective picture of the world. For the Russian people, it was important to see a strong leader who, after many years of humiliation, would protect and defend Mother Russia. So this is why he became so popular. This virile figure, this strong leader who brings all these assets, the, the, the buff guy on horseback or in the scuba diving suit, Russians largely believe that story. Or do they view it as the way we view it, as this thing that is interesting but is, can't quite really be who the guy is? Urban, well-educated, intelligentsia, uh, they traditionally were very critical of any government in Russia, if you analyze Russian history. And of course, uh, they're critical of Putin. But, you know, particularly if we take into account that real Russia is located in the provinces of Russia. You know, in Siberia, in the Far East, in the Far North. And particularly for them, Putin, so to say, looks like a good czar, I mean, you know, who can come and fix everything, I mean, yeah. So in certain sense, which is not good, I mean, but in certain sense, Russia is ruled manually, as they say. And Putin is considered as a good czar who can come and fix things on the spot. But we need to divide. Russian society. Again, I repeat, there are different perceptions and views of Putin, but still a majority of people, especially in Russian provinces, perceive him in a very positive way. Putin's popularity ratings at one point, before the global financial crisis in 2008, were up close to 80 percent. They started coming down not necessarily because of it actually went back up after the, the rebound after the global financial crisis and, and went back up with the Georgia war, but they kept sort of sliding downward. Never went below 62%, which is a fantastic pop approval rating in any other context. It's only in relation to that peak that he had before. What was the explanation? It was not, in my opinion, that he, he had done anything wrong. It was that he had just been around for so long. You know, there were people 20 years old or 25 years old thinking, oh my God, I'm going to be an old man before <laughs> this guy is out. So it was, it was that, that fatigue factor, polit politician fatigue factor that began to play. But it translates then into protests and demonstrations, which frightened Putin and his entourage tremendously. But I don't think it is that, you know, he was hugely popular for the very reasons Yuri talked about from the beginning. And I can assure you that the, the most committed, liberal, pro-Western, pro-democracy, pro-free market uh, leaders of Russia, at the time Putin was appointed, said this is a good thing. We have to have, for some period, maybe a year, maybe two years, a really strong hand at the helm of Russia, because we could not put push through the reforms with a weak central government. We need a strong hand. And this guy was one of ours. Well, and you say in the book that, uh, that Putin's uh, governance has looked more like a mafia don than a throwback either to uh, the czars or to uh, communism, for sure. But let's actually start with you, Yuri. Is that a reasonable way to perceive uh, Putin's governance of the country? Uh, in 1990s, state institutions were so weak in Russia they didn't exist de facto, and the only viable, I would say, quote unquote, law enforcement agency in Russia was the so-called Russian Mafia. If you wanted to do business in Russia or in any other so former Soviet Republic, you had to get what is called Krisha, which is, means roof, I mean protection from organized criminal groups. Otherwise, it was impossible to function. And frankly speaking, um, my view is that in 1990s, you could put to jail any Russian businessman, and you will be right, because any of them violated some kind of laws or rules. I mean, because it was impossible, you know, to function in Russia without violating some kind of rules or laws. I mean, it was a question of political decision. I mean, whether you want to put someone to jail or not. I mean, 
And um, uh, still, I mean, they suffer from, I would say, this period of wild capitalism or gangster capitalism, as it was called. But let's not forget, it's been only 22 years since the breakup of the Soviet Union and since they began its transition from extreme socialism to capitalism. It takes time. I, I just want to clarify this notion of the, the mafia. Yuri's right. The, the Russian mafia, very, very powerful. I mean, Putin has, he con essentially controls what was the mafia organized crime from the 1990s in the sense, when I say control, uh, it's the Russian word or the French word or the German word, control. It means monitoring, supervising, knowing when to intervene to, 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 to steer it in the right direction. It doesn't mean you are the head mafia boss of the Russian mafia. The, the mafia analogy is different in, in the way we present it there. It is, it's really the essence, the essence of Putin's um, understanding of and attraction to private ownership is the following. The Soviet system of having state ownership of companies didn't work. It's inefficient. Why is it inefficient? Mainly because there's no accountability. Putin recognized that this is the problem of making an economy work, is you've got to have people who are accountable. Otherwise, everybody just steals. Everybody steals. And that's what they were doing. The greatest swindle in history, the greatest uh, looting uh, of an economy in history. Now they were by the Sochi Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Perhaps. a different story. That's, <laughs> no, that's going. peanuts compared to what we're talking about here. Um, and so Putin could have made, he had a choice to make. He had the power, he had been head of the, uh, the FSB, the, the form, former KGB, comes into office as president. They all feared, and he had made sure that they would fear that, that he was going to dispossess them. It would have been the most incredibly popular measure he possibly could have done to cement his popularity and power, Putin's, if he had just taken it all back away from them. He chooses not to do it. Now, why? He offered them a deal that if they could keep their property, they could keep their companies, as long as they always deferred to him in key strategic de decisions about their business activities inside the country and outside the country, if they paid their taxes, which they weren't doing before, which is the reason the whole state was falling apart. And by the way, there'll be no stealing in this company because Mr. Potanian or Deripaska or Friedman or Avin or the, the group here, they're not gonna let people steal from them. They're capitalists, right? So you control, it's much more efficient control. I control the whole economy. They own basically the whole economy. I control the whole economy because I control them. Control, again, in the sense of I know what I, they know what I can do to them, they know what I, and I know what I can do to them. This is, by the way, just to interject something, this is why this idea that the United States and the EU has of sanctioning some of these top oligarchs. They say these are close to Putin, and when they get, feel pain, they will tell Putin, you know, to back off. I ask you, what Russian oligarch, half of whom, or more than half of whom are Jewish, by the way, and are under Putin's, he, he kind of runs the anti-Semitic and controls it in a certain way, uh, movements inside of Russia for, for special kind of blackmail purposes. He's done ever since 1998. But these guys are so impopular, and there's so many websites that say, hang all these guys, you know, and they call Putin a Jew because he, he, he defends them. I mean, there's a huge latent, you know, power there. Putin is protecting them. Do you think they would come to Putin and say, Vladimir Vladimirovich, um, I really am suffering badly from this, and I think you should capitulate and maybe give back Crimea. To, I mean, they wouldn't last one second. The pain we can cause them is nothing compared to what Putin could cause them. So they have to just choose. Doesn't this also raise really interesting yeah. questions about that much of the philosophy of the West in the last two decades has been that the way to preserve world peace beyond the, the end of the Cold War has been about economic insinuation into one another. And that the more business we do with the Russians and with the Chinese and such, the, the less likely we are to end up in global conflicts with one another. But what you're describing is something that suggests that maybe in the end, national interest ultimately will always prevail uh, and, that, and that that's really not a, a particularly rational or a dependable way to look at a relationship to a country like Russia. Unfortunately, speaking about Russian-American economic relations, um, our trade balance is you know, ridiculous. I mean, it's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, $38 billion, I mean, which is uh, 
peanuts. Yeah, it's true. Our, our economic interrelations with Russia are, are very small. They're actually about the same as a medium-sized Central American country and the United States. Right. But it, what it does, what economic interaction does, is it provides an interface of exchange of people, in my opinion, which is much more important than the flows of money. But real people, real business people, real people working in Moscow for Western, even U.S. firms, uh, Russians coming to the United States, business people coming to the United States to look for partners to do deals. And of course, interaction across the board in non-commercial relationships is equally important. And by the way, I think that could be one of the victims of this current sort of emerging new Cold War, or whatever it might be called, that if we isolate Russia, and that seems to be one of our strategies, that we will penalize Russia by isolating Russia, we're really shooting ourselves in the foot for the, for the long run, because our only hope of a Russia that is friendly to us is one that really is integrated and has shares certain common interests with the rest of the world, which they will realize and develop as they establish personal uh, relations and other business and professional relations. And if we cut that off, we, you know, what, what do we do then? We just automatically will make Russia into a problem for us for decades mm -hmm. to come. What should the position of the United States be now in terms of either winning this particular confrontation or <laughs> converting it into some sort of a, uh, converting our relationship with, uh, with Putin into something at least not destructive, if not constructive. Uh, if I were advising our administration, I would say that most important is not to isolate Russia. Be because if we begin to isolate Russia, it will really, um, uh, you know, uh, contribute to very conservative forces, nationalistic forces in Russia. It might drive Russia in Chinese arms, you know. It might f make, you know, Putin to, you know, find our other alliances, you know, to counterbalance the West. So my position would be main thing is to use diplomacy as much as possible and not to isolate Russia. Despite all these sanctions, I mean, which is probably, I mean, appropriate uh, in a certain sense, uh, but not to isolate Russia. This, is, this would be my advice. So Clifford, how, do, then, how would we translate that into act, an actual uh, tactical approach to this situation? Well, I, would, I think it's very complicated what we do. We, we have conceded, as I said, that Crimea is part of Russia. We're not going to be able to change that. We shouldn't pretend. Uh, I don't think we should pretend that we can give security guarantees to Ukraine, because I don't think we can. Uh, we really have to hope that Putin thinks we've understood the message, though, as I said, I don't think that's evident from the way we're acting, necessarily. Uh, we have, there, there are two possible interpretations of what he's doing. One is, there's a traditional Russian philosophy, defense strategy, and this dates back to the Soviet Union and before that to the Russian Empire. Russia, as the biggest land power in the world, has, does not have the natural protection of an ocean separating it from its potential enemies. It needs a buffer zone of countries that cannot be, you can't fear that the enemy is going to get them. And you really don't recognize truly neutrality because you know that a country that's not able to protect itself will be subject to pressure or occupation even by your adversary, those guys out there that are trying to get Russia, against you. And Russia has always had that philosophy. I think that that was even Stalin's philosophy. It can be more paranoid and less paranoid, and if it's more paranoid, more fear of the outside world, that means that border has to be bigger. But there are positive cases in history where countries have been able to maintain some degree of independence and sovereignty without being either part of one or the other. Finland, of course, is the example. Now, maybe Finland is a unique situation, but somehow that has to be the hope that that's all it's about. Because there is another interpretation of what Putin is up to right now, and that is the notion of the gathering of the Russian lands, that this is an imperial project to get, not conquer the world by any means, but the traditional Russian lands where there are Russians, Russian speakers, these needed to be brought back in 
to, the, to, to, to Russia. And the Crimea doesn't tell us one way or the other in itself. It can be interpreted in different ways. Uh, there are other places that, I mean, I'll just be honest. I think if Putin wants them, he'll get them. That's even eastern and, 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 and southern Ukraine. Where there uh, is a predominantly yeah. Russian population. Yeah, I mean, speaking. we couldn't stop it. Now, where it gets to be very dicey then, and I, on the other hand, Finland is safe. Finland's already given Russia a big chunk of its territory, so it's already paid that price and then defended itself. Uh, the Scandinavian countries are in no danger. Who's in danger? The Baltics. Because e e under both of those interpretations, the Baltics have reason to be nervous. And I think that the West, I mean, I'm not a person who advocates a military solution to things, but I think that the West, these are members of NATO, and they're not going to leave NATO. And I don't think Putin thinks they are ever going to leave NATO. So they have to, it has to be clear that these are members of NATO. We will live up to our agreements in NATO. If they are attacked, we will defend them. And we, I think we know they will fight. But at the same time, um, I think these economic sanctions are, we think that's an easy way out. I think that's the worst. I think they're dumb. I think they really are because counterproductive. they won't accomplish anything, but it, yeah. except to further antagonize it, it, the situation. It, it, they will antagonize it. They will weaken the forces inside Russia that really are ultimately the positive ones for the future. Isolating Russia is not good. And, um, you know, we'll promise things we can't deliver on. Uh, as soon as these sanctions start to, to hurt ordinary Russians, Putin's popularity goes up. It, it will go up. You've invoked this uh, this this darker scenario uh, in just your last comments. That uh, and so I, I think I have to just follow up on that. That that the my very first question to you, I used the word appease, and I wondered whether either of you would uh, would grab that word uh, and 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 discuss the notion of appeasement in the sense that we most often talk about it in the sense of 1939 uh, and whether there are parallels uh, between that moment in history and this moment in history. There is this parallel between this dark picture, this dark scenario you paint of a, a shattered country that uh, a charismatic leader, uh, the necessity of a strong hand to put it back right, uh, newfound power, a focus on the military, uh, an ethnic desire to reconsolidate the people who speak the same language who are now divided up among many countries, uh, and in the beginning, a claim that all I'm trying to do is rationalize a, a limited number of boundaries. Uh, it does sound a lot like uh, the, the late 1930s in Germany. If I may, uh, just in addition to what uh, Clifford mentioned, um, again, I repeat, this situation, dark situation, which you described, might, I mean, take place if we continue to isolate Russia. Otherwise, the idea of Finlandization of Ukraine, in our case, uh, from my point of view, makes sense. Um, because Finland cherished tremendous, I would say, success, um, taking into account its unique position as, on one hand, par uh, part of the West, on the other hand, Russia's friendly neighbor. Clifford, a, a final word from you. Our focus right now, in addition to drawing, making it clear that NATO membership means something, and with, with respect to the Baltics, we also, there's a corollary to that, which is we should never think about giving NATO membership to Ukraine or Georgia, because we're not going to defend them. We should work hard to make sure that any of the things that, from our values, just aren't acceptable, like the anti-Semitism, like the neo-Nazi sympathies on the part of political leaders in Ukraine, that these people are really isolated. We, we the West, has to put pressure on, on our friends in Ukraine to say, you cannot ally, ally yourselves with these people. If we make Ukraine a dividing line between us and Russia, we've lost Russia forever, in, in the sense of Russia being a, quote, normal country, a country that we can engage with in a normal way. Let's hope for the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And they mentioned upstairs that we do have double standards. And there are people across the world that want to, the Palestinians want to have their own, and, and, we, and Israel is occupying that territory against the Geneva Convention. And, and we've 
we decide to do nothing about it. A lot of people are focusing on the historical aspects of how Crimea is part of Russia, was historically part of Russia, and I think that it was interesting to hear that um, Putin used the history, since he's a man of history, he used that to justify his, um, his actions to the Russian people, but really his underlying motive was to send this message to the United States.